Hi, good evening. I'm Natalie Cohen, and it's my pleasure to serve as the Assistant Director of 92i Talks. On behalf of everyone at 92i, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are here to celebrate the newest book from Robert Herjavec, You Don't Have to Be a Shark, Creating Your Own Success. If you haven't already picked, purchased your copy of the book, I encourage you to do so. They're on sale in the lobby, and Robert will be signing following tonight's program. We will also have time for your questions following the conversation. Please write them down on the note cards that were handed out to you, and our ushers will collect them midway through the program. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our guests and notable sharks. Our moderator, Barbara Corcoran, is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the country. She went from waiting tables to starting the first female-owned real estate firm in New York City, which grew to be the largest real estate brand in the business. We are thrilled to welcome her back to 92i. Her subject for the evening, Robert Herjavec, is the son of Croatian immigrants who fled communist Yugoslavia. Over the course of the evening, you'll learn about his childhood, his growth as a dynamic IT entrepreneur, and his secrets from Shark Tank. We can't hear, wait to hear what they have to say, so without further ado, please give it up for Barbara Corcoran and Robert Herjavec. We've been having a heck of a good time backstage. I've been flirting with Robert, knowing he's got a gorgeous new wife. <laughs> and then I don't have a chance, so I could talk to him dirty, do whatever I want. He doesn't care. <laughs> Very nice to be with you, Robert. Thanks for doing this, Barbara. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. Wow. Thanks for coming. We can't see anything because the lights. There's actually people out there, Barbara. This is so different than Shark Tank. Oh, yeah, yeah. We don't see anything on We don't that see show, anything. Except a big old camera. Well, uh, we have 45 minutes for questions and answers, and uh, I wrote 45 questions. I, <laughs> I ignored all the ones his PR company gave me because I thought they were so boring. <laughs> but that only leaves Robert like 45 seconds for each one. So let me start with what he's dying to tell you about, which is... <laughs> His immigrant story. <laughs> I've heard it at least 5,000 times on Shark Tank. They always edit most of it out, but he wants to tell, go ahead, Robert, tell us about the boat you came over on. Yeah. <laughs> Barbara, should I tell him about the rats I had to eat on the boat yeah. on the way here? As long as you make it short, I don't care what you tell him. Uh, right? yeah. <laughs> no, we always make fun of, uh, I was born in, uh, what was the time, communist Yugoslavia, and uh, my mom and dad and I came to Canada on a boat with one suitcase. I can't tell the story anymore because Barbara always makes fun I of me. I can finish the story. She's like, oh my God, if I have to hear that story one more time. <laughs> but it's true. And, uh, you know, we were like most people, we were just immigrants to this country and made our way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, what about your dad? Was he your role model? Was he a tough dad, an easygoing dad? You never really flesh out the story more than that. Did you love your dad? Did you love your mother? I love you. <laughs> um, wow, it's like hard hitting. No, not at all. Um, I'm just, I'm no, just I, at least curious. I, I think I was like most immigrants. I was really embarrassed of my dad. I hate to say it. You know, he mm -hmm. wasn't a very... He didn't take me to baseball games. He was a typical immigrant. He thought his job was to work and put food on the table. And that's what he did. He worked two shifts most days and walked to work. And, you know, back home in Yugoslavia, he was an entertainer. He loved to sing and that. I, I know. know that. I didn't My get God. any of that. Wow. But, and he was very good at it. He was a great singer. And uh, I don't know how I didn't get that quality. But when he came here, it was really hard on his pride because he had to sweep floors in a factory. Oh. And it, I think it really hurt him his whole life. It was really hard on him. But as I got older, and you know, when I was younger, you're embarrassed because he looks funny and he had this big, thick accent. He talked like this. And he would, he would always wear this red, like this black babushka type hat <laughs> that they wear in Eastern Europe, even in the summer. Oh, God. And I was like, it's 100 degrees outside. He says, my head cold. <laughs> and, uh, but I learned to appreciate as I got older how hard he worked and mm -hmm. gave us that opportunity and really drove me for many years. Well, I would say, uh, knowing you, and I've known you for seven years, I would say if I had to rattle off uh, uh, three dominant traits, interesting enough, 
I would say one would be you're a hell of a good dresser. And perhaps that's a reaction to your dad's babushka thing. Yeah, maybe. I'm just, I'm just yeah. wondering. I would say that you're probably the hardest working man I've ever met. You never stop working. I mean, you certainly play hard, but you are such a hard worker. Got to believe you got that from your dad. I did, yeah. Absolutely. And I think you're a phenomenal entertainer. You're entertaining whether oh, you're on TV you. or off TV. So uh, what did you get from your mother? <laughs> um, love. Mm, biggie. You know, it's funny. We're doing a lot of interviews today, and uh, somebody asked me, what's the greatest thing you learned from your mom? And I learned love and humility. Mm. Because when we came here, you know, when we were back in Yugoslavia, we lived, you've never heard this story, but it's, we lived in this little village with dirt floors, and Kim and I actually went there, but I didn't know it was poor, because everybody oh. lived like that, you know, it just seemed yes. normal, but when I came here, I went to school the first day, I didn't speak the language, I wore the same pants every day, because we didn't have any money, they were always clean, my mom washed them, mm. and kids would make fun of me, and, you know, and beat me up and stuff, and my mom would always be there with a big hug, and she would say, I love you, and then one day when I had a really rough day, she said to me, I go, oh, I'm, you know, I hate it here, I hate it here, and she said, uh, no one in life you will ever meet will be better than you, but you are no better than anybody else. And it always taught me about humility, mm -hmm. oh. right? Well, I would have to differ with you because I do know another part of you, how many uh, sports cars you own, that you lived in the biggest house in all of Canada. I think, I think this humility thing, I don't think you got that one. Uh -uh. No, 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 no. But you know what, Barbara? I love to play at things. I do. And I, I am as excited about getting a new car today as I was when I had no money. I'm as excited about my new Rolls Royce or Ferrari as I was about my 1987 Mazda RX-7 in gold where the door wouldn't shut. And if I went around the corner, I actually had to hold the door because I was afraid it would open. And I have this incredible joy about things like that. And I always think, I couldn't afford any of these things. Now, how great is it that we get this opportunity? And same with the show. How great is it that we get to do this TV show and inspire people? Oh, my God. That's not a given. That's something I think we all appreciate every day. Right? Absolutely. All right. Now we're going to move right on to... Um... You're a great interviewer, by the way. I've never, I've never interviewed anyone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My first. I'm losing my virginity with Robert tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Never interviewed You're anyone. so talented. Okay. Ah, save it for the suckers. Okay. <laughs> so tell us how you sold yourself on your very first job, because selling is such a large part of the book, and I don't think I've ever heard anyone describe better how important the act of selling is in anything we do in business or in our personal life. I think your book is hugely effective in conveying that. But tell us how you sold the first guy on hiring you. That was your start. Well, thank you for those comments. Um, everything I learned in that book and in sales was nobody taught me. I did it all wrong. And then I had to learn from it. You know, and Damon and I had this talk one time and we're saying, you know, Will the, will the smart people, will the strong people get farther ahead? And I always think it's the people that are more adaptable. Mm -hmm. And I think I've always had that skill that I'm not really that quick, but when I put my hand on a stove and it gets burnt, I learn. I don't do it again or try not to. Um, so what was your pitch to that guy? You sat down and said, hey, hire me. Why? Why did he hire you? So I'm sitting there, and I actually... Uh, was in the film business. You don't know this story. Actually, I do. Oh, you you do? told that a hundred times, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I produced the Winter Olympics for Canada when I was like 19 or something. It was a big deal. And my head was this big, but I couldn't get a job. So my roommate, Steve, who has a master's in computer science and a doctorate in math, went for this interview with a computer company. And he didn't get the job. And so I'm complaining how I can't get a job in film. He's complaining. And he tells me the starting salary is $30,000. This is way back. Wow. And I'm like, money. what? So I call the guy up. I go in for an interview. I'm sitting there. And this was the former head of IBM Canada. And he's starting this little tech company. And he's looking for employee number one. 
And he realizes really quickly, I have, he says, do you have any sales experience? I said, no. He says, do you have any computer experience? I said, no. And I can tell he's, he's kind of getting up slowly to, to leave. And I said, but you have to hire me. And he looks at me. He says, but you have to hire me. I said, I'll, I'll do anything. You need people to answer the phones. You need people to unpack boxes. I'll do it all. And so he's halfway up. He's like, no, you have no experience. And I say, I'll, I'll tell you what. And I said, I'll work for free. <laughs> and he stops and he says, kid, if I hire you for free, I can't depend on you. And today I have a lot of confidence. Back then I didn't. And somehow I mustered up this confidence and I said, his name was Denis, Denis Ramon. I said, Denis, you can depend on me. <laughs> wow. uh, and I put out my hand. Uh, uh, and he put out charming. his hand. And just before we shook hands, I said, one condition. Six months from now, if I can do the job, you'll pay me what you would have paid me if I had the experience. Wow, what a That's how I got my first job. So the downside of that story is great story. So I leave and I'm like, woo, I got the job. I'm like, holy crap, how am I gonna pay for my rent? <laughs> so I left that job interview, drove to the fanciest restaurant I knew in downtown Toronto, got them to hire me as a waiter, and so I waited after work until two in the morning to make enough money to pay for my rent. How smart were you? Yeah. And you stayed at that business many years, I think. You didn't leave after I six months. I stayed there for many years. I ended up running the entire business. No surprise. And, you know, it was great. It was a great learning experience. That's what I always tell kids. When you're in your 20s, never take a job for the money. Always take the job for experience. You only get one or the other. You never get both. Am I right? <laughs> Do you think that's true? I really think when you're young, you either get the experience or you get the money. But it's hard to get a job when you're young for both. Well, go for experience. Oh, wholeheartedly. Always. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What for was your sure first while. job? Well, you're not interviewing me here. Well, I'm curious now. <laughs> what, was your, what was your first job? I was a playground supervisor on summer, in the summertime when I was 11. I was a good one. Really? Yeah. And that's your Were you very final, organized? That's your final question. Oh. Extremely so. <laughs> All right. In the book, what I found more interesting than the main storyline or the very um, well-expressed lessons along the way were little nuances that left me paused and wondering. Here's one of them. Overcome. I'm quoting you. Wow. Did you really write this book? <laughs> Overcoming the dark corners of our personality that make us insecure is the key to being accepted. And you're very convincing argument is you need to be accepted in any sales situation. Mm -hmm. You need to be accepted for who you are if you're going to sell anything. So what do you mean by overcoming the dark corners of our personality that make us insecure is the key? I think that people see us on the show and, they, and people say this all, all the time, it must be great to be you. Mm -hmm. You know, you have no fear, you're confident, mm -hmm. it's easy. And I always think no matter how big you get, the difference is those insecurities for me never go away. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wake up and I'm scared of this, I'm scared of that, I worry about this or that, I wallow in my own misery some days. You do? Can't I imagine. think the difference is how long I let myself stay there. Mm -hmm. I think when I was younger, it would affect me for days. Now, I, I just don't have the luxury of that time. Mm -hmm. I try to limit those darker moments into, you know, small boxes. I found it fascinating when you told me when you realized that your marriage was going to end and how distraught you were about that, that you went to your local priest for advice because you were feeling depressed and so shocked over the whole ordeal and feeling sorry for yourself. I read between the lines, but you marched over to Seattle, Washington, and you signed up for serving homeless people in a mission. And then you later went on to describe how that really helped you get over your own pain. Why yeah. was that? I wasn't it, sure I got why that worked. And, you know, I know it, it, yeah. it. You know, I don't want to make it seem uh, bigger than it is. It makes me sound really wonderful. You know, I have to be completely honest with you. I only did it out of pure selfish reasons. Sure, you wanted to heal yourself, and I wanted you to leave the and, and I was very honest with I, a friend of mine. His best friend is the priest who runs all the homeless missions in the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. And he went there and he said, oh, how great that you're here mm -hmm. to help others. And I said, I said no, I'm, you know, I, that's great. I'm just here to heal myself. And I just felt like if I went, I was so low that I felt if I went 
and hung out. This is going to make me sound awful. I felt if I went and hung out with people who were worse off than me. Oh, God. That it, sounds awful. <laughs> you know, I, I think sometimes you just need to feel like you have the ability to affect someone else's life. Mm -hmm. I think when you feel that loss that you have no hope or you have no value. I felt like I had no value to add to anybody. Amazing. You're running a big company. You have beautiful yeah, but, children. But you know, I, I, I felt like I needed to be around people who were really lost. Mm. And I thought maybe in that I could help. I felt if I could help another human being, mm -hmm. it would help me, which sounds really awful and selfish. And it was, but it was an incredible experience, and I'm really glad I did it. Mm -hmm. I was just, I had never heard that. I mean, that's a great story to tell on Shark Tank. Instead uh, of the other yes. one, you know which one I'm talking about. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But you know, here's the amazing thing I learned out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so you would think that, and this was really not a fun place, really dark with people who were abandoned and homeless and mm -hmm. addicts and a recovering program. And I was there for a couple of weeks and you would think that it would be very negative and you would think it would be very dark. But I learned there was so much joy. These people were so happy to have a place to sleep mm -hmm. or to get a meal or to know that tomorrow they were going to have a roof over their head. Because every night, you had to line up to see if you're going to get into the mission. Mm, I didn't know that. So there's no guarantee that just because you're sleeping under a roof today that you'll get to tomorrow. And it's incredible. I, it was completely the opposite of what I expected. It was a, a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised. Uh, we're going to move on to a very joyful subject. Kim, where is Kim? Is she here? Stand up and let people have a look at you, baby. <laughs> <laughs> My first question is, when did you fall in love with Kim? And tell us, wait, put it in the context. Suddenly, you're going to be on Dancing with the Stars. Tell us a little bit about, after you tell us when you fell in love with Kim, mm -hmm. tell us about the prep work, the hours of dancing, what it really took, how you got in shape. But before that, when did you fall in love with Kim? <laughs> Um, when I first saw Kim, I was scared of the entire experience. I was so petrified. And I really didn't, I mean, I, I was like a deer in the headlights. I mean, she's beautiful, and I noticed that right away. But I was just so scared of the whole experience. I thought, what am I doing? Why am I here? And then we had to go for a ride in the car. And she was supposed to interview me. And I ended up asking her questions. You know but how you were already in on the show, or she was deciding was the first when day. you were going to it be. It was in. the very first day yes. when we started rehearsing, and so we're driving down the street. And you know how nosy I can be. So I started asking her all these questions, and I realized that she's as beautiful on the inside as she is on the outside, and she's an incredible woman. And I fell in love with her right in that moment, there. right there. I mean, she just made me believe about a future that I thought I would never have. And in that moment, I knew it would be. There you go. Well, now, I, she fell in love much later. No, I was just like, <laughs> You beat me to my line. There was a lot of selling between that okay. moment and the... <laughs> that, that was my line I was going to deliver. to say, well, I have bad news for you. She never fell in love with you. <laughs> well, I always no. say... That is my testament to what a great salesman I am, because uh, here she is today. <laughs> no, I think women would stand in line to marry you, Robert. I defer, I defer uh, with that. For all those cars you have, all those houses, <laughs> you have no problem. <laughs> what was the biggest challenge with Dancing with the Stars? Was it the sheer physicalness of it, or was it performance anxiety? And you had never danced before. I would think you're nuts, but whatever, each of their own. It, it, well, it was really hard. People don't realize how physically demanding it is. Mm -hmm. uh, what people may not realize is Shark Tank, ABC buys 35 episodes, 32. City. We have more episodes than any other show on network television. And we film 17 days. That's nothing. Kim and I were on the show for 75 days in a row. We wow. rehearsed 8 to 10 hours every single day. Wow. I mean, it was really, really hard. I got into great shape in that. But you know, the hardest thing, and I learned this from Kim on the, at the beginning, I said, 
how does the audience and how do you know when someone can't dance? Mm. And you know what Kim said? She goes, it's in their eyes. Really? Yeah. She well, goes, let's get Kim up here. You sit down. We want to do that. She said, people that can't dance are lost. They look everywhere and they don't have any confidence. And so that was the hardest thing is trying to learn the steps, stay in the routine, not let her down, and try to sell myself to America. Wow. Very hard. And how many actual episodes were you on? We were there. We only missed one week. We, oh, we got really far. I know it's shocking, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. You know, first day I met Kim in the very first day of rehearsal, Kim wanted to know what she was working with. So she says, so Robert, you're at home. The music comes on. Show me how you move. And I was like, what a come on. Ah, this never, woman is ah. smart, yeah. And, and I said, I, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, I wasn't a dancer, but now I am. Let's switch over to Shark Tank. When did you realize I was your favorite shark? <laughs> <laughs> no, I know um, I'm not. I know Lori is. I see it. There's a magic between you and Lori that really makes me upset. Well, it's be you know, it's not. I don't know if that's true. You were, you and I were there since day one. Yeah, but you never flirted with me the way you flirt with Lori. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you never. No I never got to sit next to you. You, you wanted to change seats and sit next to Mark Cuban because he has more money. Absolutely. I know you. <laughs> Any smarter than you? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that first? day when we started filming we sound like old folks no i don't but tell oh the first day yeah yes it was so scary it was so you know so kevin the mean bald guy and i yes. we did the show in canada and so when we started filming the first day it was kevin barbara damon myself and a guy named kevin harrington another kevin yeah and so we're all sitting there, five of us, and Kevin and I did the show for seven years. So they say, go, first picture comes out, and Kevin and I are like... Like bullets. Yeah, <laughs> like, no problem. And everybody else is ready. First guy comes out, Kevin's like, blah, and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. And the other three are like... <laughs> but you want to know what's very interesting? I, I don't know if I've mentioned... I, I must have mentioned to you. I didn't know that the two of you were experienced sharks. You just thought we were so good I at it? I thought you were so much better than us, instantly. <laughs> well... And do you know what happened at lunchtime? I said to uh, Damon, I said, hey, Damon, I don't know about you. I just know we're going to get fired. We are terrible at this. <laughs> no, it was sincere. And Damon said, nah, you're the token woman. I'm the token black. Our job is... <laughs> I go, really? Oh, okay. I'm um, speaking of Damon. I you know, noticed... that's really hard. What people don't realize is... What? People always think that we, you get a chance to speak. That's what the guest sharks always say to me. It's oh. so hard. Like, when so is hard. my turn to talk? Yeah. Because we don't give you a chance to oh, talk. You no, got to. You have to learn how to jump in. You got to learn. You're seasons. very, very good at that. No, I'm not. Trust yes, me. you are. No, I'm always trying to jump in. You're ignoring me, and, and I have a bone to pick with you later. Okay. <laughs> now, Damon John, this is what I find so curious. A perfectly uh, smart business guy, a lot of money in his pocket, able to invest. Uh, very much tells it like it is. Good judge of people. I just think he comes with a big package. But despite all that, why? <laughs> why are you laughing? I haven't asked the question. Why haven't you ever invested with Damon? What's what's you know, the chip on? Come it's... on. What's the scoop on? You don't like this guy, I don't think. No, the uh, truth. Be honest. Be honest with until you, you said honesty. That. Until you said that. Short. Go ahead. Okay. Be um, short. Okay. Because we're really, you know, we're really good friends, and our daughters are really good friends. But and, uh, there's a big B-U-T. You've never invested with him, and I want to know why. I don't know. I've invested I with you. I for him. Of course I have. I've invested with Lori, with yeah. Mark. With, with everyone. With everyone, but... Sit here. 
And um, Barbara is You're right, about I don't the package. Like <laughs> oh, I was enjoying that. Oh, this is nice. So why do you think he has an investment? Do you feel offended and injured by this? You know, that's, I, I mean, we, we went in on a whole bunch of uh, five shark deals, but... That's true. That's true. That doesn't have, count. Why doesn't Select, that count? Selecting you to be his partner, that's a whole different gig. Yeah, and I think we oh. go against some of the same products. You beat me on a couple of that that long board. Remember that one? Yeah, yeah. You beat um, me on a couple. I don't know. Uh, that is a good question. Yeah. Maybe I like you too much. You know, as with Barbara, I have no problem calling her <laughs> and being mean to her. Mm. Yeah. Do you guys still collaborate on deals? Well, I tend to not want to do deals with anybody. I tend to I've not want to do deals. Yeah. We, I think we've all learned that. The only reason is I feel... Uh, it's not that we dislike each other, but it complicates the deal. We it have does. we have our own group management groups. We have our own vetting process. We have our own attorney. And Mark Cuban just and gives everybody all the money they ask for right yeah. away. Right. <laughs> and yeah. never calls. I'll, them. I'll never forget. We had this deal I did with Mark, and my team's on the phone with the pitcher, and his team's on the phone with the pitcher, and we were going to give them six hundred thousand dollars each to buy inventory and upgrade the factory, and the entrepreneur says. I changed my mind. I want to use all the money to redo the website. 1.2 million. And my team is like, oh, that's ridiculous. Robert's never going to go with that. So we get off the phone. We go to call Mark, and Mark's already given her the money. Wow. That's rich. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I remember him saying, well, you know, I got to keep my people employed or the, all the people that work on the deals. And so the Billy Blanks deal, you know, when, he, when I go out to get Billy and stuff tell, like that. Tell yeah. me what the Billy Blanks deal was. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a great one. And um, Billy couldn't clear the name. So Mark gave him all the Billy money. Billy Blanks I just took the credit. was an exercise company, right? Yeah. yeah, but I just took the credit. Mark gave him all the money. I took the credit for it. So <laughs> it's just uh, really nice to have Mark around. Mm -hmm. Remember that gig that we did with Mark where it was a large amount of money, I don't know, yes. $300,000 or something like that? The, um, he for an investment? No, no, no for a uh, speaking gig. He was speaking, it was like $300,000, they wanted to pay more. He doesn't even answer the phone, so I said, come on down and, 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 and do the gig. It's for a great foundation. Another, he goes and do the gig. As background, a number of the sharks were doing the gig together, and he didn't want to do it. Right, well, he, did, uh, he didn't have time. He didn't have the time. Barbara says to him on stage, oh, we don't get paid as much as this guy. Mark says... Oh, we're getting paid for this? <laughs> they send Mark the bill. It's a foundation. They send Mark the, they send Mark the invoice to say invoices for $300,000. He sends them $300,000. <laughs> That's they, not They called back and said, I swear to you, not true. this guy sent us through it because it was a charity. He thought that he had to give to okay, the charity. That kind of money. we got to start sending our invoices That's to Mark, right. Barbara. Yeah. <laughs> Mental note. I think I'm going to put my name on a charity. Yeah. That's what I'm going to I'm going to start sending my wedding bills to him. <laughs> <laughs> there was another deal that I actually valued how cheap you were about it because it saved me money. We invested together. The first deal we ever invested in a I bike grease company of some kind. Grease for a bike. Grease Great monkey. name. Grease, grease, grease monkey. monkey. Yeah, right. Great name. Great name. Great product. Two great young entrepreneurs. Mm. A woman who was a dynamite. And a sidekick that was so-so. Well, anyway, <laughs> anyway, we, we bought it's into true. her, right? And then she made an application to get a scholarship to graduate school and got it and called me up and said, I'm sorry, even though on Shark Tank she said, I promise you I'll never leave you. Within a month she was gone, you know. And uh, she said she got the scholarship. And I said, I'm sorry, Robert, it looks like we're going to lose the money because her sidekick's a clunker. And, uh, and you said, what? That's not the deal I signed up for. I'm asking for the $50,000 back. You could ask for money back. And he went and asked money back. And I said, quick, call it back and say, I want my money too. And I got it back. That's and we good did. money, we got money coming money back. back. That was yeah. shocking to me, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I'm supposed to be moderating, even though now I feel like just having a beer and drinking with you guys. <laughs> like usual. I didn't want to crash. I want, I want to listen to it as well. I'm excited about doing? the book. Okay. I'm, I'm very How's excited the about the book. The baby as well. She's really good. Yeah. yeah. You know that Damon just had a baby girl. He has two daughters already, almost grown, I would say, right? Yeah, well, I didn't have the baby. Somebody else did. Yeah. <laughs> but Baby's you know, adorable. Beautiful baby, yeah. Beautiful. We would say that no matter what that baby looked like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And they both were there uh, right, right uh, the next day. Um, you were the only people we allowed in the room, really. There's probably like... 
the, uh, her mother and my mother. That's it. Yeah, I was there as I was leaving. Barbara was coming in. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great night. Great night for all of us. All right. So, uh, so going back to your book, because that's what this evening is really about, even though we have an uninvited guest here. <laughs> um, you clearly don't believe in predestiny, and I'm going to quote a phrase in your book that stopped me and made me think. When we arrive on this earth, this is your words. You wrote the book, right? <laughs> when we arrive on this earth, you be, uh, we begin our lives. We can't control where we land. Oh, sorry. Mis I mistyped. I typed myself. This when happens we all the time on the show. Yes, it does. But you Usually with numbers. math. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> when we arrive on this earth, we begin our lives and we can't control where we land. If we work to control where we go, every step we take on our own is a measure of truly the kind of person we are. I don't get it. What were you talking about? <laughs> it's, I thought, whoa, this sounds amazing. And I thought, what's he saying? But I know it's important. Um, you know, I, I think it's just, and I think all three of us, I think it's the journey that we get to. People always want to get to the end result. I think it's the path that we take and all the little things we do along the way. And but you don't feel that when someone's born... Uh, just their happenstance in life, what they're born as, who their parents are, uh, where they live, uh, doesn't predetermine most of what's going to happen in their life? You think after that it's the steps you take individually that determine Yeah, absolutely life. not. I think, I believe, I know this isn't true, but I believe I'm in absolute control of my own destiny. I believe I'm responsible for everything that happens to me. I know that's not true, and I know that crap's going to happen, and bad things are going to go this way, and good things that way, but I control how I react to them. Mm -hmm. And if I would have believed the opposite, I wouldn't be where I am today. I'd be in a little town in the middle of nowhere. I mean, what other choice do we have if we don't go out and make the most of this opportunity? And I think that's our nature. I think as human beings, we want to do better. I don't think anybody wakes up and says, I want my life to suck. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Right? I think it is human nature to want to do better, whether it's for ourselves, to buy a nice car, take care of our family, whatever the reason. Mm -hmm. Are they, so you're saying that people don't say, I want my life to suck, but we become what we think about most of the time. Are you saying that if they convince themselves that no matter what, life will suck because it sucks for this person, it sucks for that person, and we can't get out of, our, out of our circumstance, do you believe they convince themselves that life will yeah, suck? That's a great point. I think we're a function of the things we think about. And that's why I try to be very careful with the words that I use. You know, because I think the subconscious is so powerful that if we, if we wake up every day and say, oh, I have to go to work. I have to do this. I, ha I try to always say, I have the privilege of doing this. Like we're launching this book. I'm super tired. I was up at six this morning. You know what it's like. And I try never to complain because I think I've really worked my ass off to be this busy. And, and, and uh, I have to tell you something. The man really does. My oldest what are you daughter. What up there for? I'm just kidding. Because I want to ask a question about this really quick, Barb. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let, let my, my, oldest, my oldest daughter is, is my oldest daughter is a competitive ballroom dancer. Um, She's very uh, good. Yeah, I've tried dancing with her, and I don't have I don't have the drive or discipline to dance with her. And to see what you did, I, I with our schedules, yes. I I really can't I imagine you doing that. I'm curious, and I may I may have missed a little bit because you know, um, black people are always late, but. Um, <laughs> You don't have to be a shark. Did you explain what that meant? Do you know what, Damon? Uh, I really resent that. <laughs> uh, because uh, let me take that mic from him really fast. Uh, it's all a question I'm going to ask. I just okay. want to know the, the theory of it. It's a great question and one I overlooked. Why don't you ask the guy? So what is the thesis on you don't have to be a shark? Is it... Mm -hmm. Not everybody's going to be in that position, or is it you really are a shark? You don't just have to, because you, you're in control of your Wait, life. let him answer his own question. No, no, no. One this is not multiple choice. Barbara, I'm talking. Right. Like on the panel, you don't. <laughs> Go ahead, Robert. Um, you know, one of the, the thing I find on the show is a lot of people, I don't know if you, 
this happens to you guys, but a lot of people come up and say, oh, you know, I can't start my own business because I'm, I'm not pushy enough. And I wasn't born like that. I'm not aggressive. And, you know, I can't be like that. And I always think you don't have to be a shark. You don't have to be pushy. You don't have to be something you're not. I think you have to be able to stand up for yourself. But it's okay to be nice. You don't. It's okay to be nice, but you don't think someone, any entrepreneur starting their own business has to be pushy and aggressive. I know those have negative connotations. I don't happen to think they're negative words. I think there's a difference between yeah. pushy and firm. I mean, I think it's better to be nice than not, but you have to be careful people don't take advantage of you. Mm -hmm. Just because you're nice doesn't mean other people aren't going to try to manipulate you. You have to be wise that way. Mm. But, you know, when I started out in sales, I didn't know anything about sales, so I just tried to be nice. Mm -hmm. I tried to be the guy that people want to do business with. And people used to say to me, you don't know anything about the product. You really don't know that much about sales. But my gosh, you're a lot of fun. Every time you call me, there's a smile on my face. And but I you think are, uh, to be perfectly honest, you're like the wolf in sheep's clothing. <laughs> I don't yes. know if that's oh, true. Yeah. Oh, yes, I've competed with you, yes. You're slick as they come. You've well, got those baby blues and blah, blah, blah. It, and then it, you take the deal. I, that's only because I'm like competing hey, hey, with you. You know what I believe? What do you believe? I believe with all the entrepreneurs that I've invested in that have done well, uh -huh. they've all been very nice, truly nice people, good people uh, coming from the That's right true. place. That's true. You do invest in nice people. With all the people I've invested in that I lost my shirt, they've all been very nice, really nice people. <laughs> but I think the dividing line is their degree of chutzpah, hustle, push, determination, not feeling sorry for themselves, which you uh, mm -hmm. referred to earlier. And so I feel I'm going to have to write a book to compete with your book. And it's going to be, <laughs> it's going to be called, You Do Have to Be a Shark <laughs> to Create Your Own Business. There you go. <laughs> what do you think, Damon? Well, Damon, I don't want to take up too much more of the time. I want to listen. Damon has a great book called The Power of Broke. And when I went for the photo shoot for the book, they said, you know, I wasn't happy with the pictures. And I said, and Damon looks really good on the cover. He's like this. And he always looks so cool and mean. I said to the photographer, make me look like Damon. <laughs> and yeah, right. work out. It no, work no. Out. <laughs> yeah. And I said, I don't look mean. You don't, because you don't have to be a shark. Oh, You're looking beautiful. Yeah. I think, we're gonna, I think we're going to turn now. It's 846. We're going to turn to the audience for questions. So I think we have questions that people already handed in. Oh, right. Are we going to allow the audience to raise their hand and shout a question too? If anybody has any... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going, to, I'm going to read the really good ones <laughs> and then get to the others. Why does the panel allow Kevin O'Leary to be so nasty to them? <laughs> Everybody wants to know that, right? Do you think Kevin's nasty? <laughs> this, is your t this, is, this, is, this is your this is your panel, um, man. I'm just here. I I think I think <laughs> you know you what you see is what you get. Yes. I think Kevin is really blunt. Yes. And he has no problem. He is the guy that when you go out for dinner and you know your steak's not quite done the way you wanted it, but you feel bad for the waiter. You don't want to say anything. Yeah. He'll He's say the it. guy say, take this stupid thing back. Yeah. Like, he won't even think about it. And I think he comes across that way. You know what I think? I think uh, uh, Kevin is a great actor more than anything. In person, I would have to rank him probably the uh, nicest shark as an individual out of the group. He's a pushover. He shakes when his wife comes on the set. <laughs> no, he will invest in he almost nice. any stupid business, truthfully, mm -hmm. if he likes the person. And so I think he's just a phenomenal actor and plays the big guy, tough guy thing. That's what I, I think. I think he says, honestly, I think he says sometimes what's really needed. Yes. You know, there are those individuals out there who will... Mortgage their house, sell their Mortgage their house, you know, have their whole family depending on them. They're doing it for a vanity reason because they purely just want to be this and that. And they have a lot of people at risk. And Kevin is the one who will say, you know those people that you say, you know, maybe there's a chance it'll make it. And all they hear is going to make it. Kevin says, no, he's, a, I'm not, you're Take not confused with what I said. This it. sucks. Yeah. Stop. Right. And I think that if we didn't have the Kevin, then... 
Yeah. You know, you can't You'd have be wishing them luck on the way that oh good luck, knowing yeah. they're never gonna make it. Uh, yeah, Kevin goes, <laughs> No, kill yourself. But don't you say <laughs> It's the truth. Don't you think he goes too far sometimes? Don't of you course. think that he puts the I mean, I've had all TV I've had incredible arguments with him, both on camera, off camera, because I think sometimes he puts the people down. I think there's a line that he goes beyond sometimes. And it really bothers me. It, it really bothers, bothers you, but me. it's great for ratings. Remember. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't normally see him put somebody down to me. I see him put down the you're, circumstance. You're dead meat to me? Doesn't sound You're like dead that, to me. Yeah. I mean, you're dead you're to me. cockroach? Yeah. yeah. No, he, you no like he says cockroach. cockroach. He goes, and he even says when he got into a certain business, he was the cockroach of that business, meaning small comparison to everybody else. I mean, listen, I, I don't live my life like that, and I wouldn't do that, but that's just... That. Okay, so we've concluded we don't like Kevin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next one. Do you ever broadcast if you're rejects? I assume someone means by that rejected entrepreneurs that we don't buy into. Make it big. Do you ever broadcast that? Yeah, they do. Yes. Always. Yeah, always. Mm -hmm. yeah, and always. we don't like it. Yeah, we hate it. We hate it as sharks because we reject someone. We lose We leverage. really believe that uh, they're not going to succeed and then... The production team follows up, finds out they're a big winner, and they go and film them. How insulting for us. Yeah. Right? Hate that. Yeah, yeah. But it's yeah. Like I don't hate it. People like, like it at home. Yeah. Like we're, we're wrong a lot. Okay. Uh, please talk about how running has inspired you. Oh, I, I was going to say, but I don't run, but I forgot. This is, <laughs> this is your show. Go ahead. How has running inspired you? I forgot. Um, I, I love to run. I've been running for many years. I find that the busier I get, the more I need to exercise. It just, I'm a pretty hyper guy, and it, it just calms me down. And I know it's going to sound really weird, but running for me is really hard. I don't enjoy it. I have never look forward to it. But you're always happy when I see you coming back to the hotel after running. Whenever I finish that yeah. run, I feel like I've accomplished something. Hmm. And there are days where I feel like the entire world's against me. And if I can get just that little win, it makes me feel better. And if I can win a little bit every day, I can keep going. Okay, good answer. Next one. Do you think that following your passion is the biggest indicator of success? Following your passion. What do you think? No, you're not asking him it's what not he me. thinks. No. <laughs> you're on the spot tonight. I, I think a lot of people confuse passion with an industry. I think that's true to when your you may, character. When you say industry, what do you mean by that? Well, so I'm a pretty hyper guy. Mm -hmm. And I fell into the computer industry. Once I fell into it, I found out, oh, the computer industry is really hyper. It changes every three years. There's a lot of change. That suits my personality. I see a lot of kids say, oh, I don't like this industry. I don't like that industry. I think you have to find the things that you're naturally good at mm -hmm. and then find an industry that applies to. Yeah, but I think that's true. I think if you're not passionate about something, you're going to have a hard time working 23 hours a day. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would add that I think passion is overrated, has been my experience. Because you were passionate about real estate? No, couldn't give a crap about real estate. <laughs> It wasn't my thing. No. But what I was very I don't passionate. believe that. No, that's the truth. That's Somewhere true. along the way, you fell in love with real estate. Somewhere along the way, I did not. And this, I'm Yes, honoring. you did. How could you work all those hours and not love it? Because I was in love with finding great talent, nurturing great talent, managing salespeople, motivating them, putting on a damn good party or a sales meeting. Designing my offices to make them look like spas. Uh, putting my face in magazines and marketing the crap out of myself. You loved, you love managing. You love leading people. Wait, why are you telling me what I love? Because I find it hard to believe you didn't love real estate. No, I didn't I've love real estate. You. But I just told you, and believe it or not, it's up to you. Okay. <laughs> but let me just say to you, my point was, in now working with so many of these entrepreneurs in the many years we've been on Shark Tank, I think passion is grossly overrated to uh, Rachel, Rachel Suarez's. You don't Goldman think the Sachs. lobster guys love no, I the think, lobster? I think the winners are passionate about what they're doing. Maybe not their product always, like my product was real estate, but I thought my real product was salespeople. I was in love with salespeople. Okay? Mm. But 
to the point, to be very direct, I have invested in a lot of businesses where I've lost my shirt, and they've lost tremendous time and money, and they were extremely passionate about their product or their belief, but they were dead wrong. Nobody else was passionate enough to pay for it, and that's a problem. Well, so I think it's overrated. I, you can be passionate, but you can't be blind. Well, you have to be humble to... enough to know when you're wrong. Yes, right. But I mean, many it's great. people are not. That's they that's keep a plugging different... along with great passion what are you, on the wrong are you passionate road. Passionate about yep. fashion. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's your panel. I want to know okay. what you think. All right. All right. Robert and or Barbara, sorry, Damon, you're not even on here. <laughs> how involved do you get in the businesses you invest in, and how do you have the time to help run them? I'm going to ask Damon first, because this was written before you arrived. <laughs> so you're on, on the spot. I'll just ask you. I'm, how I'm involved very involved, are you? obviously, yeah. and we have a team. We all have different styles. Tell yeah. them how you do so it. So I'm very involved, um, and I have a team that works with them on, on a daily basis. So brand managers that are hired to uh, facilitate and or be the, you know, be the liaison, and then somebody who's a licensing manager, and then somebody who's a retail um, retail manager who converses for all that. So Do I, you act I, as their mentor? Do you feel like you're their mentor, guiding their, guiding their hand as they go? Yes, I am in some cases, but as, as you both know, you know, it's kind of like... Um, they believe they may need a shark, and many of them, when the honeymoon is over, and or you're telling them something that they may not want to hear, like, no, don't spend that money, no, don't go over there into retail, then all of a sudden they couldn't care less about what you're saying. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Robert, how about you? It depends. Similar, you know, we have a team of people that work with them on a daily basis. Some of them we really like, and, you know, like the tip sales guys, we've become friends, and I, I think I'm a mentor to them in, in a certain way, but uh, it really depends. I mean, I've just gone back to one of the investments that makes flowers now, and we're trying to get involved with them. Uh, flowers, of, as in growing flowers? Yeah, because I've learned how, uh, you know, I have a wedding coming up, oh. and flowers can be, you, you know. You cheapskate, you're gonna go, <laughs> you're gonna ask for it for free? <laughs> free is such a strong word. But we like to be involved. What about you? Uh, let me just warn Kim. Listen up, Kim. This is who you're marrying. <laughs> um, I love to be involved with the good ones. And uh, it's, I, no, I like to be involved with everyone until I find out that someone's just not going to make it. And then I'm very impatient to get the heck out of there because you have limited resources in your own right. time. But I have to say that it's interesting. It took me many years to realize this. But I feel like my smartest entrepreneurs, my most successful entrepreneurs, always ask my advice as though I have something to give and I feel very flattered by it. They'll come and say, what would you do? It's like, oh, what would I do? And then they do exactly like they want to do. They ignore me. <laughs> and I've learned to notice that that's an indicator that I've got a winner on my hands because I think that's part and parcel of the entrepreneur personality to seek counsel, but in the end they do exactly what they want to do. It's That's a certain true. headstrong thing that I've learned to identify. You want somebody who's strong. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to ignore you. Next one. <laughs> in your first book, Driven, you talk about the importance of saying no. Why are we talking about your old book? This is the one we want to buy here. <laughs> when is it acceptable to say no? And when is it acceptable to say no, just no? You're in sales, obviously. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I always try to teach my salespeople. Good salespeople look for yes. Great salespeople find no mm -hmm. and turn that objection around. You know, time is the most limited resource we have, especially in sales. Especially when you work in a commission type of job, it's more important to know when you're wasting your time. We have a term in our industry that we call happy ears. Good salespeople have happy ears because they always hear yes. Even when the customer is giving off no and is never going to buy from you, they want to waste time, they want to buy lunches, and they're happy. They have happy mm. ears. I'm always saying, look for the no. <laughs> and, you know, in my business, it's the same because uh, in fashion, you know, a, a, a buyer, a store, never wants to say that they said no to you because in, in the event that you go off and do well. So they always wow. say, you know, um, I'm not sure if we take it in this season. Try these colors. Do this. They give you a, 
a job to come back. Right? Mm. And you'll keep doing that. And every buyer is an out-of-work designer. So they're always going to want to design your line. So you have to find them. No. You know, that's what I find in, in Hollywood. You, somebody said to me a long time ago, there is no such thing as a bad meeting in Hollywood. Well said. Because yeah. everybody loves you, it's always a great idea, and nobody ever says Because in the no. event that you end up going somewhere, they're never going to say, I didn't say no, it just wasn't the right time. Right. Yes, yes, yes. And of course, most of the meetings go nowhere at all. Right? It's true. All right. Well, this will be our last question with two minutes left, and I think it's a good one to end on. By the way, no name on this, I'm glad I am here listening to this interview versus watching Donald Trump versus <laughs> Mrs. <laughs> Mrs. Kelly. Megan Kelly. Megan Kelly. Oh, I thought it was Mrs. Yeah. Megan Kelly. Question. If you were to start from scratch again today, what industry would you invest in as a young entrepreneur? I think they probably meant what, as a young entrepreneur, what industry would you get involved in, I would think. I th no, I think, I think it was if I started again. You, you answer it however you want. Go ahead. Well, if, <laughs> if I started again, yes. I would get into computer business. And I love, I'm in, I own a, you know, a good-sized cybersecurity company, and I love the computer business because it is brutally based on value. Nobody cares what you did yesterday. I go to meetings and I tell people all these great things I used to do, and people don't care. Yeah, they don't. Nobody cares what you did before. It's all about the value you can add right now. You don't think that's true of every industry? I don't know. I think in fashion, you have a brand. You can mm. you can get a certain leeway. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think I think your theory sucks because <laughs> I want them to know what I did in the past. So hopefully, it will work towards the future. Because yeah. what if I'm not uh, on the cutting edge at that moment, but they know that I have the fundamentals of business and the fundamentals of this industry to then sooner or later get another bite at that apple if I apply myself. Right. In our industry, if that happens to you, you're not on the edge anymore. Yeah, you know what you're done. To you, you go bankrupt. Yeah. Uh, Andy Grove, who founded Intel, has a great saying in our industry, which is only the paranoid survive. Paranoid. Was that yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm very paranoid. <laughs> I think we'll end with a dessert question. Your most favorite moment on Shark Tank? Your most memorable? I hear bells. <laughs> they call wedding Maybe bells. Are we getting... Married right now. <laughs> Everyone's invited. Everyone, come. Uh, my favorite moment on Shark Tank. Don't wow. make it serious. This is like an ending type answer. Uh, 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 you know, probably the first day of filming. Really? Yeah. That it was. It memorable. was such a fun, uh, exciting time. Yeah, I for mean, you, not for Damon and I. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was my. What was yours? Um, I would say um, the time we had that weirdo guy with the Bluetooth device in the ear. Remember? Because he was so scary and I was so frightened. I hadn't been that frightened since I was like eight years old. <laughs> so that's my best memory, actually. Wow. How about you, Damon? Uh, oh, my. <laughs> Mine's is when <laughs> they had that, um, that spray um, of vitamins or something like that. That's for people who hate to take pills. And Robert being, you know, the, you know the, Robert, I call Robert like the Gomer pile of the show. He's so happy and goofy. And and so Lori says how she, you know, she obviously hates falling pills. And then Robert says to her, so let's say Lori who hates to swallow. Um, and then Cuban lays on the floor, literally on the floor. <laughs> That was funny. And yeah. Robert really didn't know what he was saying. He's like, what? what? Yeah. Uh, that was a fun moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, congratulations you, on a congratulations, wonderful Robert. accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you.